Hey everyone, thanks for joining the comms presentation with Dr. Ellen Preece about HABs in the Delta. Um, so before we get started with her presentation, we're going to start with the Aquatechnic sponsor presentation. So they've been um, nice enough to sponsor this webinar series. And if you aren't familiar with Aquatechnics, they're one of the largest lake management companies in the Western U.S. Um, they're huge in California. They were the first to do lanthanum modified bentonite treatment on a lake. Um, they do a ton of alum treatments. They do algicides, herbicides, you name it. Uh, if you have problems in your lake, they can fix those problems. And they've been a huge supporter of Calms. They have just been absolutely amazing. Since I've been a director, they, every single year they have sponsored a student scholarship. Their CEO, Terry McNabb, has just been a huge supporter of the future of lake management. So without further ado, I'm going to share screen with them and they're going to present a little bit about what they do. Hey, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. We're happy to sponsor today's event. And as part of that, they gave us a few minutes to kind of just talk a little bit about our company, introduce our, uh, our group to you, if you may not know it. So Aquatechnics is a company that's been working in the Western United States for since about 1980. I've been involved in lake management since about the early 1970s. And um, our company footprint um, pretty much runs up and down the West Coast, west of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we've been um, in this space for a number of years and uh, have a number of people that uh, kind of help us in our mission. We're, while we're an overall lake management company, we're primarily known for expertise in two kind of key fields. One is the restoration of um, lake and river systems that are impacted by invasive aquatic weeds. For decades, we've uh, been helping people remove an invasive plant like Eurasian milfoil and uh, replace it or allow the native uh, vegetation to recover by using selective herbicides. Priscillacor is the most recent addition to our toolbox. We're not yet uh, able to use it in California because of the state registration issues, but we hope to um, have that uh, out of the way soon. The other thing we have been working on for a number of decades is restoring lakes and reservoirs impacted by cyanobacteria. Today's talk is going to focus on that, you know, pr pretty, pretty much. And um, this is just something that uh, we've also been involved in. We've used reactive um, algicide treatments for decades to restore or to open water back up. Uh, probably the primary uh, one in California that we did was in about five or six years ago, the uh, Lake Silverwood Reservoir, which is the terminal reservoir for the California aqueduct. Um, they weren't allowed, they weren't able to deliver water to about 5 million users because of um, taste and odor problems and toxins that were produced by Anabena. Uh, we were able to come in on uh, short notice, uh, do a two-day treatment, and within 24 hours they were uh, delivering water again. So we've got a you know, high degree of expertise in helping people open reservoirs back up that are impacted using a combination of different algicides. We also in our operations use remote sensing tools like this to um, tell us when the lakes we manage are uh, starting to creep up and we can kind of come out and, and, and help them out. And the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is this nutrient inactivation. We've um, got an extensive history using these technologies to keep water resources and water bodies um, open and toxic blooms under control. Um, alum is a primary one that's been used for decades. This is something that was originally developed under the EPA's Clean Lakes program. Uh, we've built our um, infrastructure up to do large projects. Canyon Lake is a lake in Southern California that receives uh, phosphorus inputs from a 300, or excuse me, a 73 mile square mile watershed. And um, for the last 10 years, we've been targeting the inputs every year through an in-lake application that's been highly successful. Uh, lanthanum is another technology that we have used extensively. We brought it into the United States about 2010. Um, lanthanum is applied to the water, uh, it settles down through the water column, captures phosphorus as it goes by. Uh, it's got bond, bond is so tight that the phosphorus that it captures will basically never release. It forms a new mineral that it won't be biologically available again, and then it caps the lake sediments and kind of keeps um, stuff from releasing. 
Lanthanum technologies that we're using have advanced quite a bit. Uh, we use three or four different brand names. Utresorb filters are filter bags that we can place in inflow areas to capture phosphorus from water that's coming in. Utresorb WC or is for water column stripping. It's a liquid lanthanum form that we've used extensively. We've really got some good results with it in reclaimed water lakes where we can target the phosphorus that comes in as part of the introduction of reclaimed water into like city parks and things like that and keep you know blooms under control. Utrasorb G is a um, is the lanthanum modified clay that you apply and it comes down through the water column. Uh, the largest Utrasorb or the first Utrasorb G application in California is going to happen in a week and a half uh, down in San Diego County. We're kind of excited to get that going. And then uh, Utrasorb SC will be available shortly. It's a technology that allows um, you to uh, put a liquid material in it, it'll sink down and encapsulate it and sink down through the water column and release the lanthanum into the lake sediments to tie up uh, sediments in the interstitial waters. Lastly, if you want to look at a, one of our case studies, uh, if you Google Lake and Pond Heroes and Kitsap Lake, there's a real nice three or four minute video that explains um, how the lanthanum technology has uh, helped them out. So in closing, um, thanks for the opportunity again to speak to you for a few minutes. And uh, if you need to get a hold of us, uh, these are our, my contact information and our lead in Southern California. Thank you again. All right. So, yeah, just a friendly reminder, Aquatechnics is amazing. They are so good at lake management and they are um, extremely supportive of the future of lake management. So, if you appreciate the things that Columns does for the lake management community in California, um, we would really appreciate if you would support our supporters. And so I'll just share one more screen and then we will get to the presentation. So uh, I just wanted to give a quick little introduction. Dr. Ellen Priest, it, she works with the California Department of Water Resources. She has more than 15 years of experience Primarily works on cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins and all of the different feedback loops that are involved in the production of cyanotoxins. So she has a bachelor's in environmental and resource economics. I think that's a super cool just bachelor's degree because, you know, environmental resources are so important, but then also economics are often an underlooked uh, part of just lake management in general. You know, um, having an economic solution um, is really critical in driving home some of these projects that uh, really have a significant impact. And she also has a master's and a PhD in environmental and natural resource sciences. Um, as I said, you know, more than 15 years of experience. Um, she, she is definitely an expert. She focuses on the freshwater to marine continuum. Um, so a lot of estuary type systems. The overall goal is just to use an enhanced understanding of these dynamics to protect ecosystems and humans from cyanotoxins. I think we need a lot more people like that. And um, we're really appreciative of just what she's done for Calms. Um, she was a former Northern director. She's also been a, Nor a NOMS director. So if you don't know, NOMS is our parent organization. It's the National Lake Management Society. And she currently serves on the National Harmful Algal Bloom Committee. So uh, again, we wanted to thank our sponsor, Aquatechnics, and I will turn it over to um, Ellen. And so I'm not working on lakes specifically, but I am working on areas of the Delta that have um, some characteristics of lakes and that also experience some of the same water quality issues as lakes. And so we agreed that it would make sense for me to give a talk on one of the research projects that I'm working on here, which is looking at cyanobacteria dynamics in a lacustrian area of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And this is going to be focused on the Stockton area. Um, and this entire project was designed with Janice Cook from the Central Valley Water Quality Control Board. Uh, and we also together along with some other folks, collected all the water quality data and interpreted it and then put this presentation together. So for everyone that is not familiar with the upper San Francisco estuary or the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, it's this area on the map that has this brown outline that's the legal 
Delta. The entire uh, area is tidally influenced. The Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers are the main flow inputs into the Delta, although the Sacramento River on the northern part comprises the majority of the flow. There are uh, also some smaller rivers that flow into the system, and there's agricultural return discharge. Um, so there are areas with higher flows. There are areas that are more hydrologically isolated and, you know, are more still in nature. Um, these are peripheral areas or dead end sloughs, also marinas, and so they're they're isolated from other portions of the delta, even though they have the tidal influence. And then we also have uh, the flooded islands, and um, these are almost look like lakes on uh, the figure here, but they have a lot of tidal influence and a lot of uh, wind and wave action. The Delta has a number of different management objectives, and this is important to point out because at the end of my talk, I'm gonna go through some mitigation options um, for the Stockton area, but we really have to keep in mind these other ongoing management objectives that are occurring in the Delta. And this is just some of the major ones that I have listed here, but there's water deliveries. You know, we have the state and federal water projects that are conveying water to the central and southern um, part of the state. There are, are different management um, items in place to protect ESA and state listed fish species and their habitat. People are utilizing the Delta for recreation. People are getting drinking water from the Delta. So it's really a number of different uses that, um, the Delta is used for. And then I've just circled here in red our, um, our focus area. So this is Stockton, and that is where the rest of the talk is going to focus today. So in the Delta, cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms, also known as CHABs, have been an issue since at least 1999. There are certain areas, and these are mostly the marinas and these terminal sloughs, these dead end channels um, that have, you know, less long, longer residence times. They're having less flushing, and they're typically shallower and warmer. And they're increasingly recognized as sea hab hotspots. One of these hotspots is the Stockton waterfront area. Um, in most years, there are dense summertime cyanobacteria blooms there. You can see the picture on the right from 2021, the, the scum that formed um, at one of the ramps there. Um, they have been present since at least 2012. In 2012, the maximum microcystin measured was 2.1 micrograms per liter. And since then, we've measured um, much higher concentrations of microcystin, um, including in 2020, which the highest microcystin recording that I'm aware of in the area, which is over a thousand micrograms per liter in the scum, and then 61.1 micrograms per liter in the surrounding water. Um, I originally had put that CHABs occur annually at this location, but 2023 has proved this to be incorrect. We have been out there sampling this year, and as you all know, we had a very high water year this year, um, lots of flow, and not exactly sure yet of the reasons, but CHABs have not been present um, in the Stockton area this year. We have seen you know, the occasional microcystis colony, but we're not seeing scums of any sort. So. It's an interesting observation. This project uh, took place in 2022 that I'm going to present to you today where we had plenty of cyanobacteria and the rest of the pictures you're going to see in this presentation are from the summer of 2022. So there's been little research on the CHAB hotspots in the Delta. Um, there was one preliminary study that characterized CHABs in the Stockton area in 2012, but there's still a number of questions about the dynamics there. Why are some areas of the Stockton Channel more prone to the development of these dense harmful algal blooms? Are toxins persistent throughout the entire growing season? Um, when, if not when and where are toxins the most severe? Is there a contribution of nutrients from the sediment? The Delta is well recognized for having high nutrient concentrations in the water column, um, but there's been little work on looking at the contribution of nutrients from the sediments. And then 
what are some mitigation options that are realistic for dealing with the cyanobacteria problem in the Stockton area? So this map shows our study area. The entire study area is referred to as the Stockton Channel. Um, the I-5 bridge you can see on this map runs down the center and right-hand side of this figure. And to the left of the bridge or to the west of the I-5 bridge is the deep water shipping channel. And to the right of the I-5 bridge is the area that we refer to as the Stockton waterfront. Um, orange and the green circles are our primary sampling sites for our study. And then the blue uh, dots on this map and the numbers are data that other ongoing uh, efforts were collecting and they allowed us to utilize their toxin data from their study in our project. And so I wanted to show where they were on this map. But our study area starts at number three, the orange dot, and then uh, finishes at number 13. This is about a five mile stretch of the Stockton Channel. So in the Stockton Channel, um, the deep water ship channel, approximately 30 cargo vessels pass through there monthly. Uh, they leave their um, goods at the port and then they go down to number nine here, which is the turning basin. And they turn around and they head back out to sea. So the channel really shallows dramatically as you go east of number nine. So the seven and nine were 11 to 12 meters in depth. By the time you get to number 11 in the Stockton waterfront, we're at about six meters depth. And then number 13, we're at four meters depth. So much shallower. Uh, the deep water ship channel is integral to the city and port of Stockton's economy. It connects Stockton to the Delta and the Pacific Ocean. And then one other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, the San Joaquin River that's coming in from the south. And you can see this uh, scale on the bottom of the map that shows how far the different sampling locations are from the San Joaquin River. And it's notable that number 13, um, which is the terminus of the channel, also referred to as McLeod Lake because it is more lake-like in nature, is over two miles um, away from the San Joaquin River. So for our sampling, we collected, we went on seven, 11 sampling excursions in 2022. We did it once a month, May, October, and November, and then twice a month, June, July, August, and September. We collected water quality parameters at one minute increments at five of the stations, our five primary stations. Uh, we also collected surface water, which we analyzed for nutrients, toxins, and then also microscopy. Uh, we also collected water from the bottom of the water column to see if there was a relationship between the surface and bottom water. We were not sure if the area stratified or not, um, and we looked at nutrients at that location. And then um, to start trying to understand if there was a contribution of nutrients from the sediment, we collected sediments and pore waters um, on three different events. And the sediments we analyzed for total phosphorus, metals, total organic carbon, and then looked at the composition of the sediment. Uh, we took that sediment sample and spun it in the centrifuge and then passed the supernatant through a filter and analyzed that for total phosphorus to see how much phosphorus was in the pore waters. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the results. The first question we had is, are the top and the bottom of the water column, is there a relationship between those samples? Uh, we use Pearson's correlation. So on the y-axis is all of our top measurements with temperature, dissolved oxygen, specific conductivity, pH, chlorophyll, phycocyanin, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, phosphate, ammonia, and nitrate. And then those same parameters are the top of the X axis, and those are from the bottom of the water column. And what you can see is that we had a significant positive correlation between all top and bottom water samples. That's what's circled with the red ellipse on the screen. So the darker blue and bigger blue the circle, the more positive um, the correlation is between the top and the bottom of the water column. Um, so we observed no stratification, and we found that the water column was well mixed at all of our sampling locations. 
Okay, um, next, this is a principal component analysis and there's a lot going on in this figure, but there's a few takeaways that I want you to see. So first is we have our sites um, in the legend on the bottom. Uh, the red is our site that's the furthest west, so the deep water ship channel, same with yellow. Green is that turning basin, so that's where the ships are turning around. The Morelli boat ramp is what I mentioned was six meters in depth. That's just east of the I-5 bridge. And then McLeod Lake was the terminus of the channel. And um, that was the four meters depth. And what you can see from this plot, looking at the ellipses, is that the purple ellipse, the McLeod Lake, really separates out from the other sampling locations. Um, and the deep water ship channel sites are on the far left of the figure, whereas McLeod Lake is on the far right of the figure and more closely associated with um, the parameters that are related to cyanobacteria. So we had a really high dissolved oxygen and pH, high phycocyanin, high, high chlorophyll. And then uh, there's something else that we use here in the Delta called the visual index, where people look at the water column. And it's a, it's a qualitative ranking, but you evaluate how much cyanobacteria is on the surface of the water column. And we had the highest visual index readings at the McLeod Lake site. So I'm going to talk about this a lot moving forward, how the McLeod Lake really had the most severe bloom out of all of the locations. So these are some chlorophyll isopleths. Each panel is a different date. So the top left-hand corner is May 26th, and then we go into June, and then the bottom right-hand corner is September. Um, these are the five primary sampling sites again. Um, so on the far left, the San Joaquin River near Calaveras is the deepest portion part of that deep water ship channel. And then McLeod Lake is on the far right. And what you can see, and these isoplus is that McLeod Lake really has the highest chlorophyll concentration on almost all of the sampling dates. And as you move further west and the channel deepens, you're getting a much um, lower chlorophyll signal. Um, it's also noteworthy that the highest chlorophyll readings were taken in June, uh, early June 13th. Um, and microscopy did confirm that there was high amounts of microcystis on that date. But when I show you the toxin concentrations here in a little bit, there was no toxin on that date. So just because we had really high concentrations of microcystis, that there was not toxin present at the same time. In fact, we really didn't start seeing the toxins until um, late July, August, and September, when you can see that the chlorophyll signal has decreased quite a bit. So I wanted to show you a comparison of how the microcystis presented uh, both east and west of the I-5 bridge. So I have this picture on the far left showing the I-5 bridge as kind of our separator. Um, and everything east of there is the Stockton waterfront. So on the right-hand side of these panels, you can see uh, the Stockton waterfront. And on the left is the deep water ship channel. So the top pictures are what the microcystis colonies looked like under the microscope. And I think it was interesting that there was this pennate diatom that was apathetic to the microcystis colonies. We did see that occasionally in the deep water ship channel sites, but it was occurred more frequently at the McLeod Lake site. And perhaps this is just because we have healthier microcystis colonies, so more mucilage for those diatoms. Um, to be in. This middle row is taking a step back. This is what the microcystis bloom looked like at the two locations. So on the right at the McLeod Lake site, you have these kind of small, dense, bright green colonies. I think pretty typical of how you would characterize what you would think a microcystis bloom may look like. But on the left, um, you see these like flat pieces of algae and they present like lettuce-like pieces of vegetation. Um, and so that is how the microcystis was presenting in the deep water ship channel. So we did see microcystis on a number of dates in the deep water ship channel as well as the McLeod Lake site, but they just presented very differently. 
And then the bottom picture, if you're taking a step back even further on the right hand side, you can see, you know, this characteristic streaking that you think of when you think of cyanobacteria blooms. And from a distance, um, the deep water ship channel looks more brown, the water column. Okay, now I'm going to move into our toxins. We did look for anatoxin, saxitoxin, and slindrospermopsin, but microcystin was the only toxin um, that was detected. And uh, these samples were analyzed at UC Santa Cruz using their LCMS. The highest toxins were at McLeod Lake. Uh, the highest concentration that we measured was 270 micrograms per liter. Um, but there were three dates that it was above the danger threshold. So these three horizontal lines are showing the danger warning and caution, the state thresholds that um, California uses for microcystin. And so we exceeded um, the danger only at McLeod Lake. It's worth noting that we also saw dense blooms at the Morelli boat ramp. So that was the station just east of the i bridge. Um, but maximum concentrations of microcystin were quite a bit lower. The highest we measured was 5.9 micrograms per liter. So just barely below that warning threshold and quite a bit lower than the McLeod Lake site. In areas where we had the flakes of microcystin, um, there were toxins, and you can see that by those different color dots on this figure, but they were a lot lower. They were always below the warning and more frequently below the caution threshold. Uh, moving on to some of our water quality findings. The median water temperature was warm. So at all the sites, it was above 25 um, degrees Celsius between June and September. Um, but it was warmest at McLeod Lake, where it reached over 28 degrees Celsius on one of our sampling dates. The optimal temperature for microcystis is between 25 and 27 and a half degrees Celsius. Overall, the water column was well oxygenated at all of our sites. Part of this, at least in the deep water of um, the study area is due to aerators pumping pure dissolved oxygen into the deeper portion of the channel. This has nothing to do with the cyanobacteria bloom. This is to meet um, some low dissolved oxygen problems there, but that must have helped keep the oxygen high in the deep portion. Um, but we think that that oxygen has no influence on the McLeod Lake site. And so the microcystis bloom at McLeod Lake uh, was likely driving the really high dissolved oxygen that we measured there. So our median DO there was 12 and a half milligrams per liter. It's also worth noting that the microcystis bloom at McLeod Lake increased pH to well above nine throughout the entire water column during the bloom season. So I wanted to look at how the chlorophyll and phycocyanin readings from our YSI XO plotted against temperature. So we have chlorophyll on the left and phycocyanin on the right. Um, once again, the purple is the McLeod Lake site. And you can see the McLeod Lake site had the warmest temperatures of all of our study sites and the highest chlorophyll readings. Uh, it also had by far the highest phycocyanin readings of all of our study sites. This is another busy figure, but uh, what I really want you to take away from this is that there are really high nutrients all summer long. The top panels, total phosphorus, then we have phosphate, total nitrogen, nitrate, and ammonia on the bottom panel. Those dashed lines are um, from the literature and their thresholds for saying anything that's above this is non-limiting nutrients. Total nitrogen, um, some would argue that the two is very high, um, the threshold somewhere between one and two, and we're almost always above one during the entire bloom season. So plenty of nutrients at all of the study lake, study sites to sustain a bloom. Now moving into some of the findings from the sediment. Um, overall, we had pretty fine sediments at all of our study locations. I'm just highlighting in red um, the three Stockton waterfront sites, so those shallower sites. And it's just worth noting that we did have more gravels, uh, so some coarser sediments at this location um, 
than the deep water ship channel. Now, I'll get into this a little bit more in another slide, but there is dredging that occurs um, in the deep water ship channel to ensure that boats can pass through there. So that definitely influences the sediment composition in our study area. So some more sediment findings. Um, the iron to phosphorus ratio was high, ranging from 20 to 40. I'm showing the total phosphorus in the sediments in that figure on the bottom right generally ranged from 300 to 500 micrograms per kilogram. The organic carbon was really high at McLeod Lake, uh, which is not surprising considered all, considering all the microcystis biomass that we saw there that then likely settled out of the water column. So our organic carbon at that site was 276,000 milligrams per kilogram. Um, in comparison, in the deep water ship channel is only 50 to 60,000 milligrams per kilogram. Moving on to the pore waters, uh, there was no significant difference in the pore water TP across sites. That's the top figure. Um, but the average total phosphorus in the Turning Basin site was almost two times as high as the other sites. On the bottom figure, um, comparing total phosphorus in the overlying water column to total phosphorus in the pore water. And total phosphorus in the pore water was significantly higher than the overlying water column. This suggests that there is some contribution of phosphorus from the sediments and pore waters into the overlying water column. So moving on to the conclusions, we saw a clear gradient of bloom severity with the most severe sea habs occurring at McLeod Lake and decreasing in severity as you moved west but it is noteworthy that colonies were present throughout the entire study area. Overall, the toxin concentrations were pretty low outside of McLeod Lake, and visually the bloom did not indicate if toxins were present or not. So even though the microcystis appeared really dense in June, there were no toxins present. Nutrients and temperature are sufficient to support microcystis growth throughout the study area from at least June through September. There were still a small number of colonies remaining at the Stockton waterfront in November when water temperatures had dropped to 15 degrees. Uh, it appears that microcystis at McLeod Lake engineer their environment to give the genera an advantage over other phytoplankton species. So there's dense microcystis throughout the water column, so it's likely shading out the other phytoplankton. The pH exceeded nine at the bottom of the water column, really high dissolved oxygen concentrations during the day. We didn't measure nighttime, but one would imagine that there's respiration occurring and that the DAL would drop at that time. And then there was an increased deposition of organic matter, very high organic carbon at that site. And then our fourth finding is that phosphorus in the sediments and poor waters likely contributes nutrients across the study area and some combination of internal and external nutrient loading likely created favorable conditions for microcystis to thrive throughout the summer months. So moving on to mitigation measures. Um, like other areas of the Delta, the densest blooms seem to develop in these terminal sloughs that are more lacustrine in nature. And so maybe it makes most sense to focus your mitigation efforts on these areas. You can't treat the whole delta or manage the whole delta for cyanobacteria, but you could potentially just manage for these hot spots and mitigate a lot of the cyanobacteria blooms um, in other areas of the delta by getting rid of them in these hot spot locations. I wanted to go through some current water quality management that is occurring there. And I think these are important because this helps inform what our realistic options are for dealing with cyanobacteria at Stockton. So there's dredging um, that occurs and that's to allow ship passage. There's a picture um, of the dredging boat that we saw out there last week. So it's been out there for the past month, uh, dredging the deep water ship channel. There's also oxygenation and aeration occurring, which I mentioned a little earlier due to dissolved oxygen issues. So just being very clear that all of these current water quality management issues um, 
are not related to the cyanobacteria blooms. These are to deal with other issues that are occurring. Um, the aeration facility is capable of adding 8,500 pounds of oxygen a day, um, and it's pumped into the water and then injected with pure oxygen. Along the Stockton wa waterfront, there are nine bubbler lines. These are not oxygenation, they're just aeration, and they are providing some bubbling. When we were out there in 2022, it didn't seem to be having any impact on the cyanobacteria. So the study area is hypereutrophic throughout the cyanobacteria growing season. And so we're proposing or suggesting that targeted or near-term nutrient reductions would likely have little success in reducing the cyanobacteria blooms in the study area. It's also worth noting that there are a lot of different sources of nutrients coming into the delta and realistically being able to stop those or decrease those is not going to happen anytime in the next couple of years. There would need to be regulations and such in place to really um, manage the external nutrient loading. Um, but in the long term, you know, at a watershed scale, nutrient reductions may be needed to help deal with this issue. Chemical and biological con controls currently do not um, seem like viable options for managing water quality, preventing cyanobacteria blooms or suppressing blooms that have already been established. A lot of chemicals are not allowed in the Delta. Um, there, or an alum is another example. We cannot do like an alum application. That kind of chemical is not allowed at this time to be added into the Delta. Hydrogen peroxide is a promising chemical option for suppressing CHABs. It's a method that's generally accepted by regulators, but it would require further study to determine potential impacts, and we'd have to get permitting to allow that, of course. Um, so that would probably take a number of years, but that is something that you know could be a, a possibility in the future. So um, before I get into the recommended measures, I wanted to share this figure. Um, this is another research project that um, Janice Cook and Tim Otten and I are working on. And we were mapping the microcystis seed stock across the Delta. So we, the yellow bars are uh, microcystis in the sediments in November. And so that was to show when we thought maximum amount of microcystis seed stock would be at the bottom of the sediment um, floor. And then the bluish green bars are in April or early May. So we went out and collected more sediment samples at that time. And our, we wanted to see first if um, the seed stock was leaving the system or dying off during the winter months. And then also to see how much was available to inoculate uh, the bloom the following summer. And on the right hand, so we did it for two years. Um, at the right hand panel shows November 2021 and April 2022. So right before we went out to go sample um, for the summer of 2022. And what you can see is that Discovery Bay, which is another one of those backwater areas in the Delta and the Stockton waterfront, which is circled in red, had uh, substantially higher seed stock, significantly higher seed stock than any of the other sites. And so that's just um, suggesting that there's a lot of seed stock at these sites available to seed blooms. So in the near term, based on this information and then the study results that I just presented to you, um, some physical and mechanical controls may be the most promising option to deal with the microcystis issues in the Stockton waterfront. Uh, dredging is a promising option for this location because they have the dredging equipment and then they also have an island available, the Port of Stockton does, that they're able to dispose of the dredged material. Obviously, it would still be a costly endeavor, but um, it would be possibly less expensive than some lakes where you don't have the equipment or the place to dispose of the dredged material. The idea behind this is that you could remove a bunch of that microcystis seed stock and organic carbon. There are a lot of questions still though, you know, this would require 
more thorough evaluation before we could definitively say that this is a good idea. Uh, we need to get a better understanding of the sediment there and then the actual cost and then also figure out how often would you have to do something like this to ensure that you're not having microcystis blooms. Um, another management measure that we're suggesting is physical manipulation of the water column at the McLeod Lake site. It's very still there. Uh, if there was some way to create more turbulence that could um, allow microcystis to not, you know, have the advantage that they do over other phytoplankton species, um, they use their buoyancy to control their movement in the water column. And if we could disrupt that, that would be a possible way to decrease blooms at the site. So all of this work could not have been done without um, funding from the Port of Stockton, City of Stockton, um, both the Central Valley Water Board and State Water Board contributed funds and staff time to make sure that this project could occur and then um, restore the Delta also provided their toxin data and we've had conversations with them throughout uh, this study process. Um, and then also I got to say thanks to Byron, who's on the call for having a lot of conversations with me about um, the sediment nutrient loading in the area. So thanks, Byron. And with that, I am open to any questions. Yeah, hi, Ellen. Thanks. Thanks for this. This is John Spranza. Um, Something just popped in my head, and I don't know if you considered it or if it's even slightly related, but the way you laid out the sort of linear nat the nature of your samples from the deep water ship canal um, out into the you know, waterfront area, do you think that um, the inflows from the Calaveras River, the San Joaquin River um, were in part responsible or could have possibly been responsible for some of the uh the less the the lower levels of microsystems you see out there um just a just a question when we went out there this summer i was positive we were going to see another microcystis bloom because you know you're over two miles away from those inputs but um, so it's possible that those flows had some something to do with it. It's also worth noting that June was quite a bit cooler this year than it has been in past years. Yeah. And so the diet, what we noticed is that the diatoms really took a hold of that area. We have really high, much higher chlorophyll readings than we ever had last year, but it's all from the diatoms. And so is it possible that the diatoms just got such a good hold on it early on that they were able to outcompete the microcystis? Um, I don't know because once again, the water temperatures reached 28 degrees. And so that is optimal growing temperature for microcystis, but they just never took off this year. So we are not quite sure. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. And just a, uh, just a follow up to that answer. How tidal is that uh, terminal lake that you had is just trying to figure out if it's, if it does have some significant tidal effects that mix or could in this case stand to break up some of the colonies water does rise and fall with the tides but um it's very still there it's really i mean they call it mcleod lake because it's it's so still it almost looks like a lake but and the salinity is quite low it's like 0 0.1 ppt um but it is tidal and it does move up and down so okay. there is some influence there Thanks. Much appreciated. Great presentation. Thank you. So we I have, have a, a, oh, go ahead. A, a nice presentation. This is Tamara. Um, you mentioned that you looked at um, organic carbon in the sediments, and I'm just mainly curious if you think that's a, like a correlation that you tend to have high, you know, more organic rich sediments in backwater areas. And it's like a it's caused by the detrimental material falling down there, or does it actually help the you know, the overwintering um, cells survive if they're in 
certain kinds of sediments? Um, I think it's definitely related to the the bloom biomass and yeah, I think they are related. Probably the the high organic. We just have more cells that are settling out of the water column that contribute to the organic call um, carbon, but then also are available to seed the following year seed stock. But that didn't happen this year, and we still and you know that's the confusing part about it is there should have been plenty of seed stock and organic carbon down there this year. We haven't measured been able to measure that yet. Um, so why why did that not promote a bloom this year? I don't know. I guess I guess that's I mean that is pretty interesting because well the idea of dredging to remove the seed stock you would think would be effective this year seems to suggest that that's not the primary control on your resulting uh you know abundance and species presence right you're mm -hmm. assuming you have seed stock so that would suggest that maybe knocking back those seed stocks might not be you know well might not be always effective sometimes it might be effective right yeah it has to come from somewhere so maybe that seed stock got buried it seems unlikely because it's so far away but maybe that seed stock got buried this year by other sediment i mean that's another option that didn't bring up it's possible that sediment covered that because of its distance from the San Joaquin River, it doesn't seem highly likely, but it's possible. Without knowing how much is still out there available to seed it, it's hard to know exactly. Or maybe the seed stock that was remaining just died off for um, some reason because of the environmental conditions. Just to comment on that, um, Ellen, this is Scott Schuler. Um, you know, um, a number of years ago, I think it was 2009, we did a pretty extensive rhodamine dye study in the Delta. I mean, yeah. what we're, I mean, water within 12 hours is moving six plus miles. Um, I mean, so you're mixing sediment and, and, uh, water over very large distances over the court with the tidal, you know, especially on a large tide week where maybe, you know, low tide is two foot below um, sea level and high tide is five feet above sea level. So you can move, tr move very large quantities of water and transport very large quantities of sediment over large distances in the Delta in a short period of time. And so I would assume that um, seed stock for cyanobacteria could do the same. Just something to think about. I wonder how that works though, like in the waterfront area what that doesn't, is that, my understanding is that the dye study was in the deep water, more of the deep water ship channel, not in the waterfront area, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and I'd also like to just mention for additional thought is, you know, Discovery Bay, as I mentioned, was another area with high seed stock and it is blooming this year. So why it, would that location have a bloom in the Stockton waterfront not? The dye study was primarily completed in White Slough. Um, and um, I can find that information or Cal Boating. I think Lars Anderson wrote a report for Cal Boating on it. But if you can't find it, I have it somewhere. It was Bill Taylor. Um, it was an excellent talk, and <clears throat> I, I learned a lot from it. Oh, thank you for that. I had a couple of questions. Actually, one related to Scott's. The I don't know how much what the volume of the water is in the area you would call the lake versus the amount of water, even if it's slow and not turbulent, the amount of water that comes in and out twice a day with the tides, you know, how much, of, there's got to be some, a lot of water exchange, I would think, even if you don't see a lot of turbulence in there. Um, have you done that calculation? Uh, we are interested in pursuing some modeling 
of that area to get a better understanding of that question, but it hasn't been done yet. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, I didn't quite catch, it looked, sounded there, it looked like you were injecting or they were injecting air up to 200 feet deep into the sediments. Is that? I, and I gained, I took that off of the web. I'm not, I don't, I couldn't answer really any questions about their system. Um, I don't know if someone else on the phone knows more about it than I do. I just know that it's um, keeping dissolved oxygen concentrations higher than it did prior to the system being installed. And so what part of the, where was that, where is it that they're doing that? There are two pump facilities uh, adding the oxygen into the, it's in the deep watership channel. So that the deeper area okay. where the ships are going through. Okay. Okay. And the other thing that kind of surprises me that as dense as the blooms are, that you never you never see any kind of a decline in the oxygen um, relative to the die-off. There's well, got to be a lot of decomposition going on at some point. Yes, and you know we're only it's like a discrete measurement in the middle of the day, so I'm sure that DO is plummeting in the evening, you know, as it's respiring and dying off, but I, I don't have that. I'm not sure yet without having a continuous monitor out there, which we, it is something we're pursuing is having a, a station out there to monitor in, in real time, uh, the different water quality parameters to get a better understanding of through the, day. the condition through day the and day. night. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that could be really, really useful and interesting. Yeah, I agree. So there's been a very uh, popular demand for some questions and answers from Ellen. So I'm going to go off the chat right now so we don't keep those people waiting. Um, so if you do have some questions, um, just throw them in the chat. And if you'd like to, I'm I'm happy to let you guys um, read them and, and have that dialogue. Um, Matt, do you want me to read your question or would you like to um, ask Ellen? I will go with um, reading it myself then. Um, so uh, Ellen, Matt Growl from um, EBRPD asks, why is alum not allowed in the Delta? What is the specific concern? I don't know if there's someone with the regulatory agency online that could answer that question. I, I just know it's it's related to the regula regulations. Um, I don't know the exact reason. I, Wish we had Terry McNabb because he would know. Um, I believe you need it. I believe there is a way to do it. I think you just need the right permits and the permitting process might be uh, pretty arduous. Okay, I've always been told it is not an option in the Delta. Okay. And, and, and maybe it's, I'm assuming it has to do with the ESA listed fish species, which. Yeah. There'd be sturgeon, for example, can be. They're a threatened, federally threatened species, and they can really utilize any area of the delta. Um, and so you couldn't risk a potential uh, fish kill. I'm, I'm not saying that that's what alum does, although it has, uh, that has occurred previously in alum applications. But I don't, I can't really say much beyond that. I'm just not familiar with the reasons. No, that's actually a very good point. Maybe even the Delta smelt. Um, okay. And then the next question is from Hal, um, our uh, trusted secretary of comms going on probably 10 years strong. Um, thanks for all that you do for comms, Hal. Um, he asks, how many sediment samples would you want to collect to feel like you're removing microcystin seed stock? Uh... I guess I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Yeah, I guess I was just kind of curious about, uh, I hadn't really heard of dredging uh, to remove microcystin seed stock. And so I, I was just kind of curious mo mostly about the strategy and, and you know, where you where you would think, uh, how, how you'd be confident about that you'd be taking out a, a bunch of stock. Uh, 
how would we be confident that we were taking it out? Yeah, and and where would you strategize taking samples or or, or dredging? Uh, would it be in the uh, you know deposition zones? Um, would it be in on the in the shallows where or or in, in areas where the microcystin might uh, accumulate and die off? Or I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of dropping For my this head. For this particular location, I would suggest the McLeod Lake site because that's where we had by far the highest organic carbon. Um, there definitely are more studies that would need to, to be done. I mean, probably the whole Stockton waterfront would make sense to dredge, just like they're dredging the deep water ship channel currently. Um, I think it gets more, that question gets more complicated in other areas of the Delta if you're trying to manage other hotspots. And I'm only saying, like putting this on the table here because the equipment's available and I've the port of Stockton is who operates it. And I've asked them if, if dredging is on the table to mitigate this, if we found that that was their best option and they're open to the idea of it. So um, it could be promising to remove all that. I think we need more studies though to understand the sediment, like how deep would we have to go to get rid of it all? I, I don't know any of those answers yet. All right. Thanks. Great talk. Thanks. Mark, you're up next. Um, would you like me to read yours or did you want to? Gosh, I, yeah, I kind of, I can take it, uh, uh, Byron. It kind of relates to just this discussion, right, Alan? It's like, what what could we do experimentally? I mean, dredging just seems to make a ton of sense, just at least as a start, right? Get rid of all that organic matter. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts on what we could do experimentally with chambers and, and what we could do in the lab to help you? And then another thought I was just typing up is there, maybe with what I'm hearing is there's some tidal exchange, but could we set up a curtain area? You know, this the linear nature of the site kind of set up a side by side test and dredge. You know, one area that's curtained off add adds lanthanum based material to another curtain, like the limno corral concept. But then you like lose the flushing effect. But uh, any anything that might come to mind, putting you on the spot here. Well, I'll just say, I don't know about that kind of experiment. So I don't think I said at the beginning, like there's a public boat launch, you know, in the Stockton waterfront, there are houseboats uh, where people are living um, on some marinas kind of on the side there. There's also um, a homeless population that is living um, on the north side of the waterfront bank. So I, I don't know how they would feel about something like that. Um, as for the studies, like, I think we'd need to get an understanding of like how much material we would need to remove for it to be effective. And then Mark and I have talked some about like really wanting to answer the question too, is there, could we get rid of some internal nutrient load by the dredging as well? I think that's a possibility. It's, to me, it's unclear. Like we know from our study, it's, there's suggestion that there is internal nutrient loading, but it would be, be better to quantify that. Because if you could get rid of, you know, all of this nutrients as well as the organic carbon in the seed stock for the river. Yeah, I'm guessing there's a lot of internal phosphorus loading, even though the oxygen may be high. It's just mineralization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's this kind of conceptual model that, oh, if the sediments are oxygenated, they're going to retain uh, the phosphorus. But there, this and you had your iron to phosphorus ratios that seemed like reasonable, um, but it could be that there's just so so much organic matter there that there's uh, in, you know release kind of all the time, just keeping these things sustained. Yeah, kind of keeping like this toxic micro layer on the top to promote um, release, and we weren't able to study that. And Mark and I in previous discussions, you know, I'm dropping the YSI XO down, but you don't really know how far off the bottom you are. So I don't, for my bottom water quality measurements, I could be, you know, six inches off the bottom and maybe those bottom six inches are actually anoxic and we just weren't able to capture that with our study design. 
And so getting that information would also be helpful in a, I think a lab-based study. Any idea how deep the sediments are? Totally. Nope. I that, do not. That whole area has been receiving sediments for a long, long, long time. I, as far as I'm aware, they're dredging the deeper portion every couple of years because they need, you know, they have an agreement with the Army Corps that they need to keep it at a certain depth for those large container ships to pass through. But what's, once they dredge it, what's under, what's left? Is it still sediment? I would think so. I mean, and that's like another question. And maybe we just have naturally high phosphorus sediments in the area. So it's possible that you could remove all of these sediments and then not really. Um, you could still have nutrient loading if you have these phosphorus rich sediments. And so I don't know anything other than like what's on the surface. A core study of some sort might be able to answer that question and uh, answer a lot of questions and save a lot of time and money. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we dropped core cores to get the seed stock, but we used a ponar for our, our in the study I presented today. Um, it's hard. It's it's so mucky. I mean, the sediment is. It was hard to get like a nice core because it's just a goopy sediment, but. I'm sure if you had the right equipment, you could get a, a, a good core. It's also a lot of trash. It's, it's actually a pretty gross site. <laughs> Although uh, the city of Stockton uh, has added a trash removal boat. And so they're doing uh, trash runs through there now to try to get rid of a lot of the trash out of the area, which is nice. Hey, Ellen, you alluded to like some uh, homes, uh, the the homes on the water and homeless people. Those, do you think that's a, a pretty, could be a nutrient load to the system? I don't know how any of the boats are used for houseboats. I would think they wouldn't be allowed to dump their septic in there, but I you, don't know. You but homeless and kids and stuff can be a, a source of pollution too, just that you don't want to just not address. It's not, I would say 10 or less people probably and their pets. Live there. Yeah, there's likely a lot of, I mean, we don't know where the external nutrient loading, like we haven't done that study either where the external nutrient load is coming from how much is coming in there don't have any of that information at this time here's a big a new idea maybe to build a wall that goes up the center of your lake that you can open one side of it during in a rising tides and so that you have a pump in a sense using the tides to move water, circulate more water into the uh, lake uh -huh. and uh, just go around the horn. And, and I, I don't know if that's a feasible thing at all, but uh, uh, really increase the amount of water that actually exchanges somehow in there. Yeah, I would think that would that would really help. Yes, oh, I appreciate the Army everyone's Corps likes ideas. To do big projects. <laughs> what? The Army Corps, they love to do big projects. <laughs> and the Thank permitting you. on that's going to be really easy, right, Bill? I think it's also worth mentioning that um, the Stockton waterfront, you know, is an important place to a lot of people, including some non-governmental organizations. And so there is a lot of interest in um, improving the water quality there. There's a lot of different uh, community groups that are very concerned. 
about the water quality and the toxins that are present at that site. So there's a lot of interest in, in finding a solution uh, sooner than later. Uh, well, if anyone has any, you know, additional questions or ideas, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I don't know if I, uh, here, I'll put my email in the chat. And you say you have a publication that's going to be, it's in the works? Yes, it's been through the first uh, round of review. And so I'm addressing the reviewer comments. And we actually, for the publication, the University of North Carolina um, was out the same summer as us and was doing bioassays in their laboratory with the Stockton water. And they confirmed our findings that, you know, very hyper eutrophic waters. And so we were able to combine um, their laboratory results with our study findings to further, you know, validate the high the high nutrients that are occurring in this area. So hoping I can get that back in for a, a second review sometime here in the next week or two, and hopefully by the end of the year that will be out. Can you tell us the journal? It's Journal of Environmental Management, and um, it would be an open access article, but I'd also be happy to distribute it to people. Excellent. Put me on the list. Okay. And it does that paper. We're, we'll have a second part of the paper that deals with the toxins. This one's really about um, the nutrients and other water chemistry parameters. Well, thanks again, Ellen. That was a really great presentation. Really good discussion afterwards. Um, yeah, a lot of compliments in the in the chat box. Um, I think everyone learned quite a bit. And so uh, before we take off, I just wanted to remind everyone we do have our conference coming up in uh, less than a month now. So it's going to be in Lake Arrowhead at this really beautiful resort, uh, the Lake Arrowhead Resort and Spa. A lot of nice amenities and they got us a cheaper rate. So it's 160 bucks a night. Um, and then one final reminder as well is that um, we're doing we're going to have um, columns for 2024 is actually going to be dual columns noms. So it's going to be in Lake Tahoe, a much bigger event than your classic columns conference. It's a full week. And so we're actually putting together a planning committee right now. So if anyone has connections to Lake Tahoe, um, is very interested in attending and just helping out with um, general things, whether that's collecting presentations, getting speakers, doing local events. Um, if you are interested in helping, I'm going to put Todd Tijan's uh, email address in the chat box and um, reach out to him. Um, he has plenty of tasks for all of us to do. We'd be working with the NOMS committee as well. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again, Alan, for such a great presentation and for teaching us so much about this uh, very complex ecosystem. Um, you know, maybe in a year or two years, we'll uh, we'll learn more about the seed stocks and how all of this is intertwined, and maybe a dredging project or or something else. So. Yeah, we are um, planning to continue working in that area. So 